This morning is from the prophecies of the prophet Hosea. He's a particularly interesting prophet who truly lived what he preached. Hear the word of the Lord, O people of Israel, for the Lord has an indictment against the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or loyalty and no knowledge of God in the land. Swearing, lying, and murder, and stealing, and adultery break out. Bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore, the land mourns and all who live in it languish, together with the wild animals, the birds of the air, and even the fish of the sea are perishing. Yet, let no one contend and let none accuse, for it is with you is my contention, O priest. You shall stumble by day, the prophet shall stumble with you by night, and I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because you have rejected knowledge. I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will forget your children. The more they increased, the more they sinned against me and changed their glory into shame. My people consult a piece of wood and their divining rod gives them oracles. For a spirit of whoredom has led them astray, and they have played the whore forsaking their God. They sacrifice on tops of mountains and make offerings upon the hills under oak, poplar, and terebinth because their shade is good. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. is anything, anything 
that takes the place that belongs only to God. And idolatry has to do with the things that are the priorities in our life. The uh, business of idolatry is concerned with what is it that is ultimate in our life? Where is it that our ultimate loyalty lies? Idolatry is a matter of the uh, principles that we use to determine what will be what we will do not just with the big things in our life but with the everyday moments of our life and when we think about idolatry in that way idolatry is ever been as prevalent in our own time as it ever was in the days of the biblical prophets and one of the uh, purposes of the Lenten season is to help us become aware of the idols that have taken up residence in our lives, perhaps without our even knowing that they are present. That's what it was with the idolatry that had overtaken the Hebrew people. And it is that idolatry to which uh, the uh, story of Hosea and uh, Gomer is addressed, and particularly the text that Christy read for us uh, this morning. You remember that uh, strange story of uh, Hosea and Gomer, don't you? You remember that when God wanted to uh, speak to the uh, Hebrew people about the idolatry that had overcome their lives? He told the prophet Hosea, who was unmarried at the time, to go out and marry a prostitute of all people. And that uh, prostitute, whose name was Gomer, is intended in the writings of Hosea to be a symbol of the idolatry that had overtaken the Hebrew people. Gomer's lifestyle of constantly returning, turning her back on the life that Hosea, that she had with Hosea and turning again to uh, uh, prostitution and immorality is intended to be a symbol of what was happening in the lives of the Hebrew people. <coughs> For the Hebrew people had to begun to turn their ultimate allegiance away from God who loved them, cared for them, and had delivered them from Egypt, <coughs> and had turned in their ultimate allegiance toward the worship of the God Baal. They made, we're told, these little wooden statues of Baal, which they placed in various places around their homes. And as the text that Christy read for us this morning reminds us, God said to the Hebrew people, My people, my people have turned to a piece of wood. My people have turned to a piece of wood and seek an oracle there. So you understand that this text is intended to uh, call us to pay attention to the idols that have become a part of our life. It is concerned about the result that's going to come from those idols because the thing our text wants us to understand is that those idols are not real. And something that is not real can never provide for us what it is that we are ultimately seeking in life. It's something like the experience that uh, uh, my mentor, uh, Fred uh, Craddock, uh, uh, related Fred, he told about a conversation he once had with one of those uh, greyhound uh, racing dogs. You know about those greyhound uh, races? where uh, 
they have those uh, parks, you know, and people bet on the dogs, and the dogs chase the mechanical rabbit round and round and round and round the track until they are exhausted. Day after day, those dogs exhaust themselves chasing that mechanical rabbit, and then when they are no longer uh, able to race, they are put out for adoption. When they are too old or incapacitated to race, you, their owners put an advertisement in the paper that anybody who wants to adopt one of them can come and get them, usually for nothing. And those dogs that are not adopted are put to sleep. So Frank says he, is, uh, he has a niece who, whenever she reads one of those ads about the greyhound dogs that are available in the newspaper, just absolutely can't stand it. And she goes and adopts one of those uh, big, ugly, um, racing dogs. And she always has one of those racing dogs in her house. I actually saw one of those dogs walking down the street with this uh, owner not too long ago here. But uh, Frank tells about one time when he was present in her home and found himself uh, sitting alone in the uh, in front of the fire in the living room with no company except for that retired greyhound racing dog lying there alongside his chair. And uh, so he reports this conversation with the dog. He said, I said to the dog, I hear you're retired from racing. Do you uh, miss all that glitter and glamour and excitement of the track? And the dog ran and said, no, no, I don't miss it at all. Well, watch quit, Fred said to the dog. Was it because you were too old? And the dog frowned and said, no, I still had quite a few late races left in me. Well, why did you quit? Did you quit because you weren't winning anymore? No, I won over a million dollars for my owner in the time when I was racing. Well then, why? Why did you, did you quit? Did you quit because you got crippled? No, no, I wasn't crippled at all. Well, did you quit because you were mistreated? No, no, I was treated like royalty while I was racing. Well, then, for heaven's sakes, why did you quit? And he said the dog sighed and said, well, I'll quit. I quit because I realized that rabbit I was chasing around the track wasn't free. <laughs> he said all that running, 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 running around the track until I was exhausted. What I was chasing was not even free. That is, of course, the way it is with idols. No idol can ever help us to find the richness of life because an idol is not free. And an idol has no power. No idol will ever challenge us to move beyond, to move beyond self-centeredness. No idol will ever challenge us to seek something greater in life than our meager needs because the idol is not real. And something that is real can never satisfy us. It is inevitable that because idols are not real and have no power, they can never satisfies. They will always, always disappoint us. I think it's important for us to recognize that we are all somewhat like the man who went to a travel agency 
and said to the travel agent behind the counter, I want to, I want to go on a cruise. Travel agent said to him, well, where do you want to go? He said, I don't know. And uh, the travel agent suggested to him that maybe it would help him if he just could spend a little time studying the big goal that they had there in the travel agency. And so this fellow <clears throat> stood there before the globe and uh, for almost an hour twirled the globe around, put his finger down here, put his finger down there. And finally, after an hour had gone by, he said to the travel agent, is that all you have to offer? <laughs> now that's exactly the question that haunted the life of Gomer, the wayward life, wife of uh, Hosea. Is that all you have to offer? Because you see, somehow she and her yearnings had gotten out of control. Her yearnings had become her idols. And somehow she constructed in her mind a reality that was out there someplace that was a great deal more exciting than the treachery of the life that she lived at home. Somehow she had created in her mind something that was out there calling to her that was far more exciting than anything double Hosea could imagine and provide for her. And you know what happened to her? Because her yearnings turned into her desires. She ended up selling, in the idol thing, she ended up selling herself in the slavery in pursuit of an island that had no power and no reality. That's the problem, of course, with island. They have no power to satisfy. And they will inevitably disappoint us. Because they are the worship of idols, the pursuit of idolatry, is a matter, is a matter of pursuing something that is nothing other than our earnings. God, why? Because it is not real. Because it is not real. We can never satisfy. I think, for instance, about a man I know in the Midwest, and you may think I stopped preaching here in Dr. Medley, but I think about a man whom I know in the Midwest who has uh, turned his devotion to the University of Nebraska uh, football team into an idol. This man's whole life fortunes of the University of Nebraska football team. And I don't know how much you follow the fortunes of the University of Nebraska football team, but this year has not been a good year for people whose whole life is centered on that football team. But this guy, he's a true believer in the University of Nebraska football team. When my uh, son was a teacher at the University of Nebraska, it irritated him no end. And I mean no end. Think that uh, as a professor at the school, he was required by the administration to uh, sign a paper relieving the University of Nebraska football players from the responsibility of attending classes <laughs> and allowing them to get somebody else to pay. <coughs> but this fellow that I'm talking about, he thought that was perfectly logical. After all, these were the University of Nebraska football players. And his whole life centered around what happened to those <coughs> football team. I have to tell you, he was probably not alone in this, but the only piece of clothing that he would wear during the fall season was that red sweatshirt that said Nebraska 
across the front. And you know, I have to tell you, when I lived in Nebraska, I had one of those bad sweatshirts. But it wasn't the only piece of clothing in the hospital. <laughs> but I've seen this fellow. I have seen this fellow travel through blizzards when he was uh, nearly confined to bed with pneumonia and sit for several hours in the grandstands during a snowstorm to watch that team play. I will tell you that when that team was playing, nothing else had any value in his life at all. It didn't make any difference if his kids were having a birthday party. It didn't make any difference what was going on in the community. He was present where the University of Nebraska was playing. He even decorated his Christmas tree in the red and white colors of the University of Nebraska team. And when? When, as happens to every team, and it's happened all too often to the University of Nebraska team this year, they lose a game. He pouts and wives and refuses to talk to his family or his neighbors or to anybody else until they win another game. There's been a lot of silence in the grass. <laughs> all because, all because he is allowed something that is uh, yearning and a passion. It become a gift in our And it is inevitable that such idols will disappoint us. So, the Lenten season is intended to remind us that all of us are in danger of allowing uh, our yearnings to become our idols. Uh, the Lenten season is intended to be a time where we pay attention to the things that have become idols in our lives. Now it is not for me to uh, list the things in your life that have become idols. Nor is it for you to list the things in the lives of anybody else that have become idols. It is instead during this Lenten season for each one of us to examine our own and ask the question where is my ultimate Lord? what is it that is ultimate in my life are there any is there anything that has become for me and I and let any of us come to the conclusion that we don't need to worry about that. Lest any of us come to the conclusion that we don't have anything in our life that is an idol. Our text for this morning reminds us that all of us have our cross. And all of us live parallelly close to that Christ line. It's something like the experience of a uh, captain of an oil tanker that made uh, regular trips from South America to San Francisco. One time when he was about to make that trip, he was approached by some drug runners down in South America who offered him $10,000 to uh, carry with him on his run to San Francisco a uh, packet of drugs. He turned it down. A few days later, they came to him again, and this time they offered him $50,000 to take those trucks to San Francisco. He turned them down. A few days later, just as the ship was about to leave, they approached him again. This time offered him $150,000 to take the drugs, and this time he reported it to the FBI. And the FBI was uh, able to uh, make a sting operation. They arrested the drug 
brothers. They confiscated a huge amount of drugs plus $350,000 in cash. And they were able to confiscate a list of drug dealers in San Francisco and arrest a number of them. And uh, after these arrests were complete, the, uh, one of the federal agents went to this man and said to him, how, how come you waited until they offered you $150,000 before you called the FBI? And he said, well, I'll cut it. It was because they were getting perilously close to my price. <laughs> and I was afraid of what I might hear. <laughs> Comes then this text that we have read on this uh, second Sunday of Lent that encourages us all during this Lenten season to ask the question. What is my cross? What is my cross? What do you pray? The dearest idol I have known, whatever that I be, help me to tear it from my and worship only 